Okay, everybody. So I am absolutely excited today because I am joined by Ryan Simpkins, aka Alice from Fear Street Part 2, 1978, which is out now on Netflix. If you haven't watched it, come back to this review. I mean, interview later because we're going to be talking spoilers. Uh, Ryan, how are you doing today? I'm awesome. How are you? I'm doing great. So I'm really excited to talk to you. You know, I was so blown away by your performance in this film. And what's interesting, I really like the character you played of Alice. And being that she's a rocker, and this is taking place in the late 70s, where did you find particular inspiration for how you're going to portray that character? Totally. Um, thank you for your kind words. <laughs> oh, no problem. I, I yeah, I, I mean, I love, I love 70s music and um, the whole new wave scene, but the, the idea of proto-punk music I was familiar with, but I really made an effort to dive further into. So I made a massive playlist of like early 70s punk with like, I listened to a lot of The Runaways, um, some Modern Lovers, New York Dolls, um, a little bit of Joy Division because they just slip in there. Um, of course, of course. Yeah, which was so much fun. But I also was like, who would Alice look up to and uh, I watched a lot of performances of like Debbie Harry and Joan Jett to sort of understand her physicality like who she would want to like imitate and eventually like grow into as a person which was so much fun just like truly a blast to be able to embody such like fucking cool ladies <laughs> oh yeah and I, I feel like you got to play like the funnest character here opposite you know the very uptight um, Cindy here. So, but I, what I love though was that combination of you two throughout this film. And I think it's the core of this film. And that's a tribute to you and Emily Rudd's performances, but also the chemistry you guys have together. Were you guys friends before this film? And how do you build that trust with your scene partner? Um, I didn't meet Emily until I got uh, to set. I, we met during my, my makeup test. Um, but I had heard lovely things because I'm good friends with Olivia Welch. We've been friends for years. And she was like, love Emily, Olivia. So cool. She's the best. Olivia is the, best. the loveliest person. Um, but we are both like super nerdy. We're both like very socially anxious people. So we were able to like sort of understand where we were both coming from. We were like, okay, cool. Amazing. Um, she's a huge anime fan. I I'm slowly getting into the anime world. Like I've watched all of like Death Note and Attack on Titan and I'm a massive Miyazaki fan. And we would just like hang out. I would force her to hang out with me like every <laughs> weekend and just like go get food at the mall or whatever. But um, I mean, she's so lovely. It was like so easy to fall into that. And she's just like the type of person that you feel like you can talk to about anything. Like no judgment. She's just there to like listen and hear you out. and. She's an amazing person. We, um, one interesting thing that happened while we were filming is I began to realize like Alice had feelings for Cindy. I was like, oh, it's more than just a friendship here. There's definitely some like queer hurt feelings and romance. And I was really grappling with that because I was like, it's not in the script. And this is the movie without the lesbians. So I was like, I don't want to bring this up to Lee because I don't want her to be like, no, 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 that's the other movie. And I don't want to bring this up to Emily. So I just like kept it to myself, but worked wow. with that feeling. And then like a month or two ago, I finally, I was hanging out with Emily and Lee and I was finally like, I just, Alice is gay, right? Like this is a gay thing. And they were both like, oh, 100% completely. Yeah. And was um, this after the, the film was already filmed or, or during? Yeah, when this you was, that... No, this was after we oh, were okay. filming. We were, this was like a few months ago when we were, we were just starting. Oh, wow. press. Yeah. I just brought it up. Cause I was like, okay, I feel like now is a safe time for me to confirm. And they were both like a hundred percent. Yeah. We, we had the same thought. So the fact that me and Emily were on that same, same wavelength without actually discussing it with each other was insane. Um, it's, it's magical in a way. And that's like the beauty of film and art and you, seeing your character a certain way and you're wondering how everyone else is seeing her and how they're seeing themselves. Pretty amazing. And it comes beautifully in this film. And speaking of that relationship you have with Alice, do you believe in the beginning of this film? I mean, sorry, relationship you have with Cindy, do you believe Alice 
believe Cindy would one day come back around to her old self? Or did she kind of give up at her at the beginning of this film? Like, was she done with her? I think she, with hope against hope, like wanted her to come back. She wanted Cindy to like be her true self. Because you always, when you, I mean, that that's such a true thing of adolescence. Like you have these friends that you feel so close to so deeply. And then as, you know, people go through puberty, you just grow up, they change. And that's so natural. And it can be the most heartbreaking thing, but you want them so desperately to come back. Like, I know you, I know who you truly are. And so while she puts on this front of like, fuck that bitch, like, I don't care about her. She's fake. She's whatever. Like, you know, deep down, she's like just waiting for the day where she turns back to the good side um, and lets out her true inner nature. And I think she begins to by the film's end, but then everything is cut a little bit short. Yes, which we're going to get to, but I, that's what I appreciate about the story is that we get payoff and that these things that are set up in the beginning do get earned, which I think makes it really good. Now, my favorite parts with you in this film are the sequences with you and Emily in the cave. And okay. it was very like, to me, Goonies had a baby with the descent, which is just crazy to kind of like <laughs> blend. But I thought that's what made it unique. Um, where are you guys? What kind of set is this? Are you actually like in some sort of tight thing? Like what's going on there? It was so, so cool. And I love that you said Goonies mixed with the descent because I was watching, <laughs> we talked about Goonies a lot like in pre-production when prepping for this film. Because to me, more than anything, this feels like an action adventure for like, it feels like, I feel like I'm Indiana Jones. I have this map <laughs> for like exploring these tunnel systems, but it's like, if, if, ever, if the Goonies died, it's like, if all of the Goonies were brutally murdered. Right. Um, and our, <laughs> it's so sad. Our set was amazing. We built these like huge tunnel systems um, and just like sound sage in Atlanta. Um, and it was so cool. We had like real dirt um, for like the floor, everyone around us on the crew, they all had on these like masks because at the end of the day, you would like blow your nose and it would be black. It was just like all of this like dirt was like being filled in our bodies. Um, but it really felt like we were in these caves, you know, you don't, you don't always get that in movies anymore. A lot of the times so they'll just like throw up a green screen, but for us, it was like, we're actually here lost in these tunnels, which was the coolest experience. And the witch's house too, was like also built on the soundstage. And I just remember walking into set and being blown away of like, oh my God, we're like actually transported here, which is such an amazing opportunity. Yeah, I mean, it looks just fun to be in the movie. Uh, but what's really cool is like, I, I really love, and I thought it was the most horrifying moment of the film was when you go to touch that blob with the flies on it and then you're running and seeing, you know, I think things alluding to the third film. Um, but t talk to me, what are you actually looking at here, this blob? What is it you're seeing? And are you seeing those like little girls dressed up that are like horrifying looking or are you kind of just playing your imagination here? So the blob was so fucking cool. We called it the heart of darkness because um, it was practical. Like in the movie, they you know when it all came together they added the flies and like some extra goo and slime but it really was this huge fleshy rubber thing that like had a mechanical heartbeat so it really was wow. on set which was so cool like that's a dream come true <laughs> i love i love practical effects so much like the original star wars i grew up on so that was so exciting to actually get to like touch and feel it and my hands were just covered with this like sticky slime um but I basically just when I had to be in the trance, just like zoned out, I was sort of like, okay, scary, 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 scary. And then when I'm like running around seeing those kids, they weren't actually there for my coverage, but I was shown a picture of like, like a photograph of what the kids would look like with their like, cause they're these like kids with these like fucked up eyes. So um, I sort of, it was honestly very difficult to run around in those caves, like with a camera guy, like in your yeah, face yeah. following you. Cause you're like, you're trying not to get hurt and you're trying not to hit the camera guy. And the camera guy's like hitting his head on the cave wall. <laughs> um, 
So it was honestly like I had them in mind, but I was sort of just like, okay, where are we going? <laughs> um, <laughs> no, that shows the skill though. And like, I, I don't think people realize how hard certain scenes like that are, especially if you're looking at photographs, you really got to pull that and get in there and use that imagination. You do so well. Um, and what I love though, I think your big character moment for sure is you get a little monologue here at the end, right before uh, we lose you and you get an ax to the face. But I want to talk about what your character Alice says here, where she's talking about dad going to jail, mom stealing so she could eat. And then around this time, she started cutting at 12. Can you just talk to me about the mindset here of the character, what she kind of realizes by the end of this film before she tragically <laughs> gets an axe to the face? Yeah, um, that was such a gift because Alice as a character didn't even exist until like a month uh, before we started filming. So my... The, the writing of the character, but also my casting was like super last minute. Um, and I think Lee had this like deep love for her and wanted to understand like how she worked. She didn't want her j- to just throw in this like fun, edgy punk girl. She was like, who is this person? And that monologue was added in while we were filming and, or, or right before we started. And it just made the script so much stronger to me personally and it so helped me understand where Alice was coming from because she is this character who just like exudes fun and seeks it out but I think it comes from this place of like she has tried to kill herself like she gave up on life and like seeked out death and it didn't work so now she's sort of like okay fuck it like if I die I die, um, I'm not afraid of that. So I'm going to put myself in these situations where I can have the most fun and feel the most adrenaline and I don't care what the consequences are. But then through this film, she sees that affect the lives of the people she cares about. Like Arnie dies, Tommy Slater, who she's always known, like she sees what that's done to him. She sees it affect like all of these people around her. And she almost dies, you know, alongside her like ex-best friend, Cindy. So I think she finally realizes like, no, that's not the life I want. Like I do care so deeply about all of these people. And she, while in the caves and connecting again with Cindy, finds this hope. Like she before was so resigned to her shitty life in Shady Side and being locked in that and not wanting anything more than that or death. But she realizes, no, I can stop it. And there's this huge future ahead of me that I can change, not just for me, but for everyone around me. And that's why it's so fucking tragic that she dies. Because then yeah. she finally reaches this moment of hope and then she's dead and it's gone. But she does yeah. make a difference because she finds the witch's hand. So it's like, hopefully- that- Yeah, I mean, she goes out on a bang and you know, I, I feel like Alice, to me, he's going to be the fan favorite of this film, kind of like Kate was for the first one. And what comes with that is a tragic ending for both of them. But yeah. you get these tweets like, you know, I, I'm sure it's already happening as the movie's already out, but like Alice deserved better, you know. So I'm wondering, was Alice always going to go out that way with the axe to the face? And was she always going to die in the film? Was that from like when you read the script? Was that always the plan? The plan was always just like everybody gets murdered. What Lee... Okay. We we talked, that's a great question, but we talked in our first meeting, Lee was like, this is the Empire Strikes Back. Like, okay, this is the that. one <laughs> where all is lost. There's like an inkling of hope. Um, and because you are introduced to all of these like beautiful, fun characters that just die. Kate's death in the first movie, by the way, is so exciting and incredible. And I'm so oh, happy yeah. that everyone is responding to it. So like with so much love and like mourning, that yeah. was maybe the most exciting thing while we were filming. I like saw the prosthetic that had been shredded up. <laughs> and I was like, I cannot fucking wait to see this movie. Um, yeah. But yeah, everyone, uh, the plan was always that we would like make you fall in love with us and then die. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, but it's so effective. And I think that's what, in my opinion, I love about horror films is when they can pull that off where you love someone, you lose them, but it, it feels more powerful. And I think it makes them go out as a legend. Um, so <laughs> just switching gears a bit, you know, having acted, you know, this isn't your first rodeo here. So you were a child actor and 
is is there something that comes with that? Like, cause you're around a lot of fresh faces. So like, are you a little bit of a mentor on set? And is there an advantage to that having done this for a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't want to ever like put myself as like a mentor or like, you know, a teacher or anything like that because you're always like a student. There's always more to learn. But I was definitely one of the more experienced people on, on set as far as the actors, just because I, I have been doing it for so long. Um, and so I, I tried to make sure, I mean, there's so much going on. And when you are a young actor, like you don't want to ever like step on anybody's toes or like ask for too much or make things too difficult. So on every set, and because uh, I still feel that way sometimes, but on every set I'm on, I always try to make sure that like everyone is comfortable everyone is like getting what they need. If they, if they have something they want to ask for, whether it's like a water or like we're doing a stunt they're not comfortable with, like it's always so important to check in with everyone and be like, are you good here? Like, how are you feeling? But I also received so much of that from like Emily. We're filming these like horrible, depressing <laughs> scenes or we're like screaming at each other in a cave. And she was definitely great at being like, how are you? Like, are you feeling okay? Like we, it, it was so nice that we had that support system with each other, but I'm also so excited for like, it's so many of, of the cast's like first big film. And I'm so excited for all of them and for me, but for also like to see them like just coming out of the gate. Like that's so exciting. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's really cool. And I like that the way the film was casted, it's, you know, super diverse. It's got new faces, but it's got familiar faces. I think it just attracts every type of audience, which I think is always a great idea. Um, so before I let you go, I did want to ask, you've written and directed shorts before. When is the feature coming? And is that your true passion or is acting or do you not kind of rank them? Um, I try not to rank them. I think the thing about, I mean, I love writing. I've always adored writing. And I think directing is also like, it, it, it truly is a passion for me. But at the end of the day, I just love being on sets um, and waiting as an actor to get the okay, go ahead to be able to like shoot a movie can feel so frustrating. And also to see the characters that you want to see on a set. So I was like, fuck it, I'm just gonna do my own thing, um, which is where those stories come from. But I mean, the passion is definitely there. And I am, I'm developing a few features right now. I just released a short which um, was really fun. It's called 19 on Fire and I'm slowly working on the feature. Um, and I have another feature that I'm really, really excited about that is like a queer horror adjacent uh, vibe that I don't want to say too much about because I don't want anyone to steal my idea. Of but course, I'm <laughs> very excited about both of them and I am excited for what the future holds. Um, behind the camera as well so yeah yeah I think that's really exciting for people to hear including myself uh can't wait to watch those and again watch your shorts that are already out and okay so my last question this is the last one before I let you go sure. can you give us a little tease about what's to come this Friday in part three will we see you again uh in any shape or form or is this it for your character and you don't have to even answer that if you don't want to it's a good question I'm trying to think of how to phrase it. Um, I will say 1666 is maybe my favorite of the three. I think it's so cool and it totally, it's a totally different, totally different energy. That is so exciting. And I would say of the three movies was the one that actually disturbed me. Watching okay. it, I was like, oh fuck. Um, and I don't know, maybe, maybe little Alice will make a little appearance or um, maybe she didn't exist yet. Or maybe, okay. I don't know. Okay. We'll, okay. Watch and find out. we'll take those clues and put them together. Uh, <laughs> no, that's exciting though. And it's exciting that you love the third film. That's great to hear because honestly, this second film blew me away. And then the whole time I'm like, man, how the hell is the third film going to top this? So it's got it's got, you know, the, the bar is high now. It's very high, but we'll see. I'm excited to watch it nonetheless. Everyone watch Ryan in Fear Street, part two, 1978, out now on Netflix. And obviously make sure to catch part three this coming Friday. Ryan, thank you so much for joining me today. I hope to talk to you in the future. Thank you so much. It was nice to meet you. Have a good night. Nice month. to meet you. You too.